by way of review. What's the difference between a Z score and a Z statistic? Yes, good. So we do a Z score when we're comparing one individual person to the population. And then the Z statistic is when we compare uh, a, a sample mean to the population information. Um, so let's have an example. So for the Z score, Let's say we've got a z-score of 1.5, and we know that the population mean is 90, and the standard deviation is 10. So if I know z is 1.5, then what is the raw score for that individual? Okay. 105, yeah. How do we know this? Have we ever heard of that? I might have to place me at a good bed out. Then Z is less common than the number of people in the world. Yeah, so the Z score is just how many standard deviations away from the mean the score is. So you look at the standard deviation of 10, multiply that by 1.5, you get 15. Add 15 to that because this is a positive Z score, you get 105. So by that logic then, let's say let's say I have a score of the raw score is 85. What's the Z score for this individual? Same population information. Negative two? No. You're on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. Z is negative zero point five. Yeah. So I said you're on, you're on the right track. But um, you just say, all right, well, this is five below the mean, so that's half a standard deviation, so boom, there you go. So finding Z scores should be pretty easy. As long as you know this and this, it, it's, it's a pretty simple um, arithmetic calculation. So you should be able to do that pretty easily. The part that seems to have been more difficult in the past is then taking this and using the table. So we will, we will practice in the future. Uh, I have some have a practice exam ready to go. So hopefully before the exam you guys will be ready to go with that as well. Um, for a Z statistic, we need to know something more than the information we have here. What is that piece? Yeah, you need N. You need to know what, what's the sample size so that you can find the term called. Well, before these statistics. Yeah, we need to end so you can find standard error in order to find what these statistics are. So, going over here for the Z statistic, let's say I've got samples 25, and we know that the population mean is 50. And the population standard deviation is, I say over there, 10. So let's say this time it's 3. All right. So for our sample with n of 25, we find our sample mean is 52. And we want to know if this is significantly above average. So how would we go about finding that? 
Walk me through it. Well, yes, that is the numerator. It's 52 minus 50. All right. It doesn't really matter as long as you keep straight which of these numbers is bigger. But according to the formula, it's it's this one. Yeah, it's your sample mean minus the population mean. All right. And then what's the other step? Let's go for it. That's one piece, but we have to know something else as well. Okay. Amanda? Yeah, we know this uh, we know this standard deviation piece, and so I'm not gonna give you excess information. So we need three over square root of n, which is okay. Yeah. So square root of twenty-five, which is five. So here in the denominator we've got three fifths. So that's twenty-six. Good. So now we've got this difference of 2 divided by 0 0.6, and I'm not a calculator, so I'll need some help. Say it again, it was 3. Point. Oh, okay. All right. So that's 3.33333333. So we get this result, and we interpret that to mean in general, what? Above average, below average? Less. <laughs> well, how does that compare to 0.05? No. That's a good question. Well, that number for now is spice up is you have to go to the table on the two dollars. So yeah, that's how you go, that's how you find the, the 0.05 number. So we can look up this 3.33 in the table, and then we've got the area between mean and z, and then we've got area beyond z. Which one would we want for this? Doesn't really matter, you can get there either way. So, put it ready, go for it. Beyond? Okay, I can't lie. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. So, it, you can do it either way. You can have the area beyond Z or the area between me and Z, and you'll arrive at the same answer. So, when we look this up in the table, what's the area beyond Z? Does anybody have your table with you? So we're looking up 3.33. Uh, we've been doing beyond. What? Okay, it was the last time. Okay, so um, between was point four nine nine five. What was the area beyond the other side? Okay. All right. Yes. So it's not going to be on T2. You'll have to flip the page to find 3.33. But it should be in the table. Or something close. So. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, we'll have to, we'll have to make the inference of leaf if we don't have 
3.33. But that's fine because there's not going to be a whole lot of difference for them. Uh, yes, along the. Yeah, it should be along the left. There's three columns, I think. There's the bold numbers, and then there's the okay. between mean and z, and then the beyond z. We're looking for the area. It's not like the opposite, where like, you're all confused, you know, what element is the board, right? So we're looking well, for the actual z now, and we're using the z to find the area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for a z statistic. <laughs> Yeah, for a z-statistic, it's, it's going to be this way. Um, for the z-score, you'll have to be able to manipulate things a little bit. You'll have to be able to go back and forth. Um, yeah. So this was the area using 3.3. This was the area between mean and z, and this is the area beyond z. Does anybody notice anything about these? Yeah, if you add them. Get point five, and so that that refers to area between mean and z. So we know that above the mean, that's what proportion of the graph, half of it, and below the mean is the other half. So if you know that, then just having either of these numbers will lead us to the same conclusion. We can compare these numbers to our standard alpha level of 0.05. And area beyond Z, it, it's very unlikely to find a score even more extreme than 3.3. And so we can compare that number to 0.05. So once we do this, what do we conclude about this Z statistic representing our sample? <laughs> that depends on the question. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, so we can say it's statistically significant. We can say it's it's very different. So can we put this all all together? How would you describe what's going on with this sample? What's going on with this sample relative? There to this population. All right. So we've gone through the, the formula and we've calculated the numbers and we've come out with this is our, our Z statistic comparing this sample mean to the population mean. Okay. So we, we go through this procedure not just to run numbers through a formula, but to be able to make some sort of inference. What kind of inference do we want to make from, based on this number? Right, say that whatever you did was the mean. If we do indeed have a uh, have a manipulation, then we can say yes, our manipulation raised scores. But even if we didn't do a manipulation, even if we just took a sample and we were surveying people about how much they like Honda Civics or something, um, we can compare this to this. We can say, all right. This is higher, but not just it's higher because I can just look at the means and I can say, well, this was higher. We want to know, based on the standard deviation, based on the sample size, is this score unusual? Is this unusually high? Is this significantly different? Or is this significantly higher? And we can say, well, based on the characteristics that we know of the population, based on the size of the sample, and then when we evaluate that difference between means, we can say, yeah, there's really something going on here. It's not just a clue. Even though this two-point difference looks pretty small, considering the relatively low standard deviation of population level, that is outside of the realm of what we just expect to have in random. Is that how many standard deviations our sample mean is away from the population mean? 
Well, that's how many standard errors. Um, okay. the, the standard error term is kind of comparable to standard deviation, except that it also factors in that sample size. Okay. And we do that because the, the sample is always going to be an imperfect representation of what's going on in the population in general. And so we have to account for that. And so the bigger the sample is, the more accurately, uh, the more accurately this sample characteristics are going to reflect the population characteristics. Okay. Okay. So if you graph the i or something, you should add the yes. standard deviation of i and then like put like the samples from it with standard deviation. Yeah, the standard deviation of the distribution of sample movements is, is standard error. Uh, yeah. So that video, I think, did a good job of illustrating that. But that's really difficult to think about, so we just... Um, so that's why it's easy to just boil it down to, well, P is... There we go. So P is less than alpha, and so we have a significant difference here. That's why we do that, because it's just a lot easier to talk about that than to talk about, well, the distribution of sampling means and blah, blah, blah. So, now that we've gone through the review, let's, uh, let's try this individually. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, give us longer. So, what's happening here is we've measured the delivery time of pizza deliveries in general in some city, let's say in the town of Bowling Green. And we know that the average delivery time for a pizza is 30 minutes. And we know the standard deviation is three and a half minutes for Bowling Green in general. And now we've got one particular shop that calculates its delivery time and finds their average delivery time is 28 and a half minutes. So the owner of this pizza shop has come to us to say, can I advertise that this is significantly lower than the typical delivery time for Bowling Green. If so, then I can print a bunch of materials and a bunch of flyers and so forth and say, hey, we've got the fastest delivery times in DG, and so you should buy from us. And he doesn't have to worry about the government saying, hey, false advertising. So there's a lot riding on this. Yeah. 
So it sounds like people are wrapping up. The, uh, are we good to come back together? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So help me out. Walk me through this. What, what's the first thing I want to do? So we've got a sample mean, which is yep, that's twenty point five. That's the piece of shop owner's thing that he's concerned about. And then we have the whoops, let me see this. We have the population mean, which is 30 minutes. And then we've got the then we've got the population standard deviation, which is given as 3.5 minutes. Alright. And then what's our sample size? Okay, we've got 36. <laughs> all right, so now we know these, and that doesn't help me draw any conclusions at all. So what do I do next? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No, you're good. Right. Um, you, you um, on the bottom. This sounds more like a question than a question. <laughs> 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 I think I get it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, so once we do all that, we get the top is negative one point five. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's work yeah. through and see what happens. Yeah. Let's work through. So, yeah, we get on the bottom we have three point five divided by six. What do we get? Oh, I guess point five eight. Okay, zero point five eight. <laughs> Well, we've got to have something to put in our characters. You can do that. You can do that. Um, yeah, okay. Well, depending. I mean, it's 0.58. So even if this is actually 0.589, that's still. So it will, it will mess with our answer a little bit, but it's not going to be a huge difference. Right. So once we run this number, what is our outcome? So negative 2.573. All right. So this is our Z statistic. So do we go to the owner of the pizza shop and say, your Z statistic is negative 2.573? No. <laughs> so, we go to the table. So, 
So when we go to the table, when we go to the table with this number, what do we look for? Do we look for the area beyond Z? Area between? So yeah, whichever you want. Correct. Um, if you look at the area beyond Z, that's going to be helpful because it's going to get us that small number of factor. But you can use the area between mean and Z and get to the correct answer anyway. You didn't get this? No. Okay. So, did you have this number here? Did you have this number here? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alright. Because I got 2.57 left, but I didn't learn Okay. Did you get 2.571? Yeah. I saw a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are you going to run? It's okay. It's okay. Did we make it negative because it's supposed to be 20? Is it supposed to be switched? As long as you're interpreting correctly at the end, it doesn't matter. But, um, yeah. The, the way the formula goes, this number and this number should be the other way around. But it's okay. So, can put it this way? And that's perfectly fine. Um, you would just get the positive 1.5 instead of negative 1.5. But all it's going to do is change the sign of z. They will still give you. As long as you say, all right, this is. As long as when it comes time to uh, to put final steps and say, all right, which is this lower or is the population mean lower? And then that needs to guide your interpretation. So that's why I don't want people to just. You know, go through this and get the number and then just automatically go through the interpretation because if you're doing that, you're missing the point of statistics in general. We're trying to we're trying to represent something about reality. And in this instance, we're trying to represent whether this guy's pizza shop is delivering faster than average. So should you buy from this pizza shop versus somebody else? And so yeah, this is faster, and based on Z statistics, we find what was the p value, or what was the area beyond Z? 0.005. 0.005. And so that's, since that is much smaller than 0.05, then we can say. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a statistically significant difference. This delivery time is significantly lower. Than the average for VG. And so if you're hungry and you want pizza as soon as possible, you should buy from this guy's pizza shop. And so uh, to answer your question about is the Z score accurate there, let's see. So that's what I got when I did the when I did the numbers, I got a Z score of negative 2.57. So did you try putting it in the calculator again? Trying to get it? All right. If it still yields something different, you might have to check your calculator settings, like it might be doing some, some funky science thing. Like there's different settings on calculators, so sometimes it takes logs or like it does crazy okay, stuff. So. We're good? Okay. All right. Yeah, depending on how you round, you'll you'll get slightly different outcomes. But if it's in this general range, you should be alright. So we managed to get through this pretty well. Um, so we compare that to 0 0.05, and we get 0 0.0051. So there we go. So strictly speaking, we can say that we can reject the null hypothesis that that there is no difference, that this 20.5 is basically the same as 30 minutes. And once we run the numbers, we find that the average delivery time is significantly less. So we can tell this pizza shop owner, not P is less than 0.05, not there is a significant difference. We can tell this pizza shop owner, yes, your delivery time is faster than the average, and so you can print up those flyers. You don't have to worry about you know, getting sued or getting in trouble with the Better Business Bureau. Because that's what our, our pizza shop owner wants to know. And that's the whole point of statistics, so that we can 
we can run the numbers and then we can boil it down and turn it into a real world interpretation. That's what differentiates statistics from, um, from a lot of other math that we may have taken that we look at and say, well, we're never going to use this again. There are statistical claims in the media all the time. You guys know those, um, the, the commercials for drugs, like take such and such a pill and it will cause a significant decrease in your symptoms of whatever disease it's trying to treat. You guys heard that? Clinical studies have shown that drug X caused a significant decrease in symptoms. When they say significant, this is what they're talking about. So there are actual everyday real world applications of this. So the last thing I wanted to mention here is something called tau. So when we do a hypothesis test, there's some degree of power. And power is just the ability to correctly identify a, an effect when it is in fact present. And so our power depends on a couple things. It depends on sample size and it depends on how big of an effect is there. So how much of a decrease does drug X cause in these symptoms? And the stronger this treatment is, the easier it is to detect. And so you don't need a humongous sample size in order to find this, this difference, to find this effect if it's real. But generally speaking, a bigger sample size is going to increase your power. It's going to make you more likely to detect an effect if it's there. And if you don't believe me, make up some numbers and then just go through and change the sample size and see what happens. <laughs> you will see a lot of research Walter memes. I like these memes. And so if you remember this, this table here with the, your findings and then the unknown truth, this is alpha and we generally like to keep that as small as possible, that type 1 error. Well, the type 2 error, beta, corresponds to not having enough power. And so, here's a, a real world example from parenting. Did anybody get money for getting good grades when you were, when you were in school? Yeah. What? So some people like sometimes I talk to my friends in high school and they said, oh, I got 50 bucks or whatever for getting A's and B's in my report card. Well, I, I grew up in I grew up in kind of uh, well hold off on that I grew up in kind of a rich area so there was there was money going around I I did not have this <laughs> um, so going back to this example so let's say the first study you've got five people and the payment for each a that the student receives is five dollars to get up to twenty five and here in study two you've got a bigger sample size. And there's a much bigger payment, $100 for each A. So which one of these, study one or study two, is going to yield more power? That is, the ability to detect an effect in this there. Study two. Because it has a bigger sample, so there's, it's going to be more likely to not be really affected if there's one score that is an outlier or something like that that's really going to have a big impact in this sample, but it's not going to have such a big impact in this sample. So that's helpful. And then the payment is much bigger here in, in study two than it is in study one. So that's going to presumably amplify an effect. So this one has more power to detect an effect than study one. However, I got a note about this. 
By the way, this is a bad idea. It's called the over-justification effect. And so this is a, a pretty well-known and well-studied uh, effect in social psychology. So if you give somebody money to do something, uh, it makes them less likely to want to continue to do it when that, that, that reward is taken away. So like, oh, I'm getting good grades because my parents are paying me money for it. And then once you stop getting paid money, then maybe that motivates people to work not as hard because, hey, I'm not getting any money whether I get an A or a C, so why work hard to get the A? And so there's, there's some, there are a couple studies that, that question this finding, so I don't want to make it seem like everybody found the exact same thing. But in general, if you take a social psych course, you will probably learn about this over-justification effect at some point. So for those of you who got paid to get good grades, it might not have been the best idea. It, it seems like a good idea on the surface, but perhaps it would be better not to. To, to enhance your intrinsic motivation to do well in school. Some people like to say that it's like, they really want to have a better job with better money in the future because they want to get a better job. Yeah, it, it may. But then, of course, if you're doing the job for the money, <laughs> preferably you'd like to do something that you truly care about and make good money doing it, but this doesn't always happen. So, so real world uh, instances of type 1 error versus type 2 error to help you understand. <laughs> yeah, as amusing as this is, this is actually a pretty good illustration of type 1 and type 2 error. No. <laughs> so this one, no. this doctor doesn't have enough power to detect the effect that this lady is indeed pregnant. And here, well, she can't, like, there, this guy's got a little bit too much uh, evidence. <laughs> so that should yeah. be it. Um, <laughs> so this, homework, this homework, as I said in the message I sent out, is due Wednesday. Um, do you have any questions? That's it. So the exam is going to be on Friday, a week from today. So next week we'll have. Yeah, it's going to be the same format. Um, I'll have the I'll have the practice exam. We can do that on Monday. Uh, we can do a review as well. I have a, a PowerPoint review. Oh my God! That was yeah. Don't give me that. You changed it. It says March third and March fourteenth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it was the 14th. I I need to talk to Tim and iron that out. Yes, we are. Have a good weekend, folks. Thank you. He said it might be after.